Um, so class attendance is mandatory and it's mandatory for a reason. We're gonna be going over a lot of things together as a group. The flipped nature of this course uh, is, is precisely motivated by the desire to make use of this time together, the synchronous time together. And it's imperative that students be here to pursue the exercises in class and to discuss the take-home exercises. The lectures that are recorded and posted, those, those postings, those recordings, will be helpful for you to reflect on the material and learn from it. They'll be helpful in a pinch if you get sick and you can't make it, or if you have court, you know, you you're on a sports team and and you're at a meet out of town and and you're not going to be able to be there that day. That's great. They can supplement a little bit. They can tide you over, but they cannot be a uh, an alternative to in, in in person attendance here. Okay, and as I had noted to those in attendance here, those in attendance will be rewarded. Uh, by being able to deliver on the uh, the types of uh, assessment tools like pop quizzes that will be delivered in class and they will be delivered early and often in this class. So so um, if there's anyone you know struggling with the question about whether just watch the videos or come to class, if there's anyone thinking, you know they're thinking about taking a lot of the semester and living elsewhere, um, that's not an acceptable, that's not compatible with the course, okay? So, so just be sure to be here and you'll do well and be rewarded for it, okay? Um, that's, that's my comment there and that's my word of wisdom for those online here. Okay, um, so I'm gonna, uh, maybe I'll keep that at the beginning of the lecture <laughs> so people don't just skip over it. Okay, so um, welcome. Today's lecture um, is going to build on some understanding that I'm trusting was built by your review of one of the, the videos. So what was that video on? Does anyone want to say? Yes. Oh, question. Yes, great. Uh, yeah, so I had a question about that. I think it was from Ardalan. It was, it was from someone here. And I did commit to it. Uh, I'm just finishing up some other things, but I will get around. What I have to do is go back and trace down the exact set of slides used for that and post it. So I will do that. It will take a little bit of time, but I think it's a good idea and uh, I'll get it done. As I had mentioned in class, um, there may be the slides update over time. And in general, they get more refined over time. So what I may post may be a slightly refined version. You know, maybe I recorded it and uh, that semester, and then I gave a later version and a later semester, which had some different slides, slightly different slides. So they won't be always one to one exactly, but uh, but I will give the the uh, set of slides generally that gave gave rise to that video. Yeah, thank you for asking. Uh, very good question. Uh, so question over, and your name. Harry, thank you. And uh, Mohammed, yeah. Mohammed, yeah. Oh, I was just answering your question about uh, what. Oh, okay. The video was about. Awesome. Are we doing questions? Uh, yeah. There was. A, I think there was another question up here, or no, was I it? Was answer. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, Mohammed, please. Yes. Yeah. No, my my understanding is that you went over various techniques that are used in modeling. Good. Stochastics. Good. Good. Yes, yeah. so I went over three major. System simulation, dynamic simulation approaches. You'll notice I use different words for it sometimes. Sometimes they'll just say simulation. Sometimes they say dynamic modeling. Sometimes you'll even hear me say systems uh, modeling or system simulation. Um, there's different sort of preferred terms in different areas of the community. Um, uh, simulation is a broader term that it also includes some methods of a very different sort in statistics that are called simulation-based methods. Um, there it's drawing values, say, from a distribution, um, sampling from a distribution. And um, 
And so if you just say stimulation in certain communities, people are confused because it's like, well, are you talking about stimulation over time or statistical stimulation? And, and often it's not like any one group, they'll think it's the one they're most familiar with. And, and so it's, it's just better to say dynamic simulation. Often it's, it's more particular. But again, in some communities, they'll just assume because it, it's the type they know. Um, system simulation, is, it's like you're, you're characterizing with the simulation a, a, a set of underlying factors involving a system. That can also be used there. Dynamic modeling, because it's modeling of behavior over time. That's what the dynamic is. It, it, it involves time. Um, sometimes you'll hear people call it mathematical modeling as well. Um, uh, and that's probably not a bad term for it, but the methods we'll be talking about in this class, they do have mathematical underpinnings, which are important and strong, even if they aren't always made completely explicit, but um, they're computational techniques as well. So sometimes you layer computational modeling, computational simulation. But it turns out computational modeling is kind of a, a broad class, and this is one of them. You could call machine learning computational modeling of a different sort. And the general term model is very overloaded. Um, uh, there's early in my career, I had a moment of pride when um, I was working at the time in Southern California. And uh, it turns out that uh, some of the students, it was their first hearing about simulation modeling, dynamic dynamic modeling. They hear it from me. And they really got immersed in it. And then I guess one of their friends told them, oh, there's a modeling show going on this weekend. And they say, oh, really? What sort of modeling is discussed there? And they said, no, it's a fashion show. You know, like they have catwalks. <laughs> and, and they came and told me, and I said, oh, good. Good, good you realize modeling goes beyond catwalks, you know? Um, that's that's great. I don't spend a lot of time in catwalks myself, despite the race, the race stage here. Um okay, so um so we discussed in that video three major types of simulation. Can anyone mention you know one of them? Uh yes, a hand in the back. Yeah. System dynamics, yeah, and, and the name? Oh, honey, thank you. System dynamics, absolutely. And that term, system dynamics, is also a little bit uh, ambiguous because it can be used in a generic sense, the dynamics of the system. The system dynamics were, you know, oscillatory, were, were, were sort of sinusoidal. Or it can be used as a proper name of, of kind of the type of modeling. And so often we put it in capital letters, like, capital S, capital D, to refer to that type of modeling. But it's a big, important tradition, spans qualitative and quantitative components, and we'll be spending quite a bit of the class talking about it um, and talking about the insights that can be secured from it when reasoning about behavior. And those insights will carry over to agent-based modeling and to the uh, other type of modeling. So what's the second type? I just gave it away. Yes, honey, you got it. Agent-based modeling, agent-based modeling. So here we have one or more populations of individual discrete agents. Um, I say discrete, meaning they're they're individuated, they're they're the separate represented separately as actors. Generally they're reified, they're kind of represented, you know, uh, in the simulation as that's an agent, that's an agent, and that's an agent. There's something to look at there. And classically, it's represented uh, using the tools of object oriented programming as what? As a, yeah, so there's a class for agent that sort of represents, say, personhood or personness, but the actual individual agent is an object, it's an object of that class. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so agent based modeling fits, tends to fit very well with kind of an object oriented perspective. The agents are these objects and they bundle up their behavior and the, and the other information about them, their attributes, their properties. Hmm? And what's the third type of simulation? Yes. Discrete event modeling. Yes, exactly. Discrete event modeling, which is 
also it turns out an ambiguous term. Um, and the preferred way to say it, for no particularly good historic reason, is just to prevent misunderstandings, is discrete event. And really, you want to read these two together for reasons I'll come back to in a moment, and stimulation, okay? Um, sometimes you'll hear people say discrete event modeling and simulation. And really, this is simulation with discrete events. And, and what that's referring to is, in something like system dynamics, you have a continual process that say flow into a stock or flow out of the stock. You have stocks that flow. We'll see them in a minute. You have kind of this focus on continuous processes. Think about water pouring into a bathtub and water going out, or thinking about, you know, over the entire population of, of 32 million people in Canada or what have you, you have thousands streaming into hospitals every day and others being discharged, people being born and dying. And we think of them as kind of continuous flows. Whereas discrete event simulation, there's these discrete events which happen at particular points. You know, things happen at a time uh, for a particular event. So someone arrives at the clinic. Um, someone is discharged from the clinic. Someone is seen by the physician for the first time, or someone uh, is imaged by an x-ray machine. They're, they're sort of events. They may be in continuous time, but they occur sort of as a as a particular event that has to be handled. And so it's discrete event simulation. Okay. Um, and that form of modeling, the name doesn't really tell it, but it tends to be focused on workflows and kind of structured workflows where there's a set of processes involved se sequentially and and a and in, and and the flow of these entities down this workflow is governed by whether there's resources available. So you go into the position to the emergency room and you sort of wait in the waiting area until the triage nurse will look at you and the triage nurse he or she will will look at you and ask you about your symptoms and they'll you don't know but they'll they'll mark you on it with a CTAS score a like Canadian uh, uh acuity score basically for triage purposes in other words how how urgent are your needs um and then you know you sit down again and you'll be waiting right until like a bed is available and then they'll escort you to a bed the nurse has to be available to escort you to the bed too so you're waiting for resources right sometimes you're waiting even to sit down in the emergency room right uh and then you got a bed and then you're waiting for a physician initial assessment wpia um waiting for physician initial assessment and and so you're waiting for these resources right and that physician may say oh we need to you know your, your arm is really hurting we need to image you we need to see if your arm is broken so they'll send you to a extra and you're waiting in the structured workflow it's kind of a well-defined workflow okay so discrete event simulation agent based Modeling, spelled with two L's or one, depending whether you're which side of the Atlantic or or the border you're on. Um, you'll see it both ways in Canada with one or, or two. And uh, finally, system dynamics modeling. Okay, um, those are the three major types. Um, and each of these are traditions that go back uh, half a century or more. Uh, and system dynamics to work in cybernetics at MIT in the the late fifties and early sixties. Uh, agent based modeling work by von Neumann. Where have you heard von Neumann's name before? Anyone want to say? This okay. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 it begins with a. Oh, that's where it go. Oh, okay. That's right. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, good, good call though. Um, um, he has something to do with has something else with that begins with an A though. So, um, but it's a different van and bond. I think one is from like, one comes from like uh, Holland and one comes from Germany or something. Yeah, yeah. Von Neumann. 
Yes, von Neumann architecture. It's an architecture for what? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's for computers. It involves a CPU that executes the instructions, it involves memory that's used by that CPU. These days, it's you know, memory, uh, what's called uh, dynamic random access memory, DRAMs. Um, but it's, it, you know, in older times, it was a piece of paper, potentially, tapes, et cetera. Um, and uh, then, then there's some other components with input, output, and so on. Von Neumann architecture. He gave his name to Von Neumann architecture. He invented things in economics and mathematics. And he was uh, highly involved as a physicist as well. Um, so John Von Neumann uh, and, and was uh, one of the first originators of agent-based modeling, where he was looking at what are called cellular automata. Um, and later it evolved in both the physics world and the computer science world and the economics world. The screen event simulation goes back to the work of Tocher in the 1960s on industrial simulation, et cetera. So all three of these are venerable traditions and virtually no classes out there teach them all the thing, except for this. So you folks will get all of it. Okay, so all three of these are there. I wanna to talk today a little bit about commonalities between them, we could. Does anyone want to say, I mean, so you've seen these different techniques. Can anyone say, what are some things they share in common? Yes. Sorry, I hey. have a question. Oh, so, question. Yes. Is there any uh, particular reason why a discrete event is called a simulation versus the other two are modeled? Uh, it's a good question. Um, not particularly because, well, okay, so so yes, I mean, the, the answer is now that I think about it, yeah, it's not immediately obvious because the discrete events are, I'm going to use the word constructs, these, these things come up in the simulation process. It's not that you build your model out of the discrete events, it's just that when you run it, the kind of um, underlying mechanism that by which it, it sort of executes things forward, steps forward, is through these mechanisms of discrete events. The actual models might look like workflows of, you know, uh, successive processes, uh, successive stages governed by availability of, of resources and so on. Um, and, you know, these, these don't have particularly discrete events. It, it's not like you build them out of discrete events. It's that, the discrete events are occurring while you simulate it. That's kind of uh, a characteristic of this sort of model. So it would be kind of weird if you called it a discrete event simulation. Um, I personally don't think this is the best term for it. Um, but uh, you know, I might call it I might call it resource, you know, structured based resource modeling or something like that. But but this is a term given historically and and I think it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so commonalities between your name again? Scott. Scott, thank you. So commonalities between these. Yes, your name? Uh, Rashid. 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 Uh -huh. Okay, so there are statistics involved. Um uh particularly discrete event simulation tradition tends to emphasize take into account statistical features of like how long it takes from someone takes for someone say to wait in this state before they go on to the next state. So once the resource is built, once you're seeing the position, how long does the, do you spend being given a history physical uh, workup with the position before you go on to the next stage? So Statistics are often used to formulate this. Uh, so I like your thought. Uh, and statistics are widely used for uh, parameterizing these models or for calibrating them or for assessing or the, the, the degree to which they match observed data. So, so I, I think um, statistics play a role in all three. Uh, so that's good. But other more fundamental commonalities. If, uh, yeah, your name? Uh, Matthias. Uh, Matthias. Yes. Uh, they all have a school, like, they have a specific verb. That's Good. Yeah, models are like maps. There's no, like, perfect map of Saskatoon other than Saskatoon itself. 
it would be crazy for you to want to use a, you know, map that's focused on electrical power connectivity in Saskatoon to try to figure out how to bike across it. I mean, it's a different sort of map. You use different maps of this part of the world for different purposes. And so all of these models, you're absolutely right, all these models have associated with them a scope. And associated with that scope are three types of ways that they could sort of relate to factors about that world out there that's their, their focus. There's three different ways in which things in that external world might be um, might relate to this model. Does anyone remember those? Sorry? Exogenous. So it's represented in the model in a pre specified way. So that's good. Endogenous. What is endogenous? Anyone? Yeah, it arises from the model. The model generates it, right? The model gives rise to it. It, 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 it generates it. And what's the third one? Yes. Ignore. Yes, name? Chiwa. Chiwa. Thank you. Um, so uh, we have those are the three basic ways in which models can relate to factors in the world. It, it can represent them endogenously. The model generates them, tells them to us. It, it gives rise to them, right? The model gives rise to it, and we listen to what the model says. We can't, can't tell it what to do for this. This is model gives generates it. it, it it's an emergent feature of the model, generally. Okay. To be exogenous, here, like endogenous, it's represented in the model. We can look in the model and find it, but it's pre-specified, right? And then the final thing is ignored. And Generally, it's a massive number of things you know, well, Just like if you add a driving map, I don't care if it's Apple Maps, Google Maps, or a, you know one of those old school map books. There's a huge number of things about city of Saskatoon that's ignored, right? Uh, and depicting it, it's not showing the location typically of every light. Which of them have left left you know protected left arrow turns? It's not showing where the zones are. You can pass a car and where you can't. It's not showing, you know, whether it's an old style curb or a newer style curb. It's not showing where the sidewalks are, or where not. I mean, generally speaking, we don't look to maps to have every single tiny bit of detail and be useless, right? We can never fit them in our phone. So these are the three characteristics. And you're absolutely right. We supply to all three of these. How about another? Feature, right? Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about a couple of features here if we could. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and we will take a look actually to some slides which I posted. So you can go, you can go find them. Okay. Um, and, and secretly, this is from the same deck that you looked at, but these slides weren't, weren't all enabled for that deck. So some of this should seem familiar, but some will will be be new to you. Okay. Um so I think simulation models represent these causal relationships between factors. I said hypothesis, I think a better word would have been positive because not all simulation models represent our hypotheses about the world. Some are just thinking tools. If it were this way, we sort of posit it. We 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 say, you know, assume it's this way, what would the consequences be? A lot of simulation, they are our hypotheses about the world. It's our maybe a working hypothesis or guess as to what's going on in the world in terms of the relationship between factors. But um, in some cases, we're just using it as a thinking tool to say, if it were this way, what would the consequence be in terms of the endogenous behavior, in terms of what it gets rise to, right? Was there a question back there? Um, um, Chiwa? Yeah. yeah. And the uh, factor like it, it's really like a flexibility, security, and um, yeah, like investigating power. Okay, yeah. So, so all of these you're saying also share common concerns about like the degree of flexibility or or their 
fidelity, their accuracy when compared with features in the world, for example. So I like that. And, and I appreciate your thought to that. I'm going to highlight here some additional features, but but that's true. Those things kind of cross these. Um, these models, regardless of these traditions, provide these ways of examining consequences across broad areas of the system um, to possible changes. And often these are what are called counterfactual changes. Anyone have a sense that that's a fancy term, counterfactual? What does it mean? Yes. Yeah, it's never been observed. It's never it's been it's against what we observe in the sense. In other words, it's different from what's been the case. And we want to say, what if this were the case? You know, what if there were a mask mandate across all of uh, of Saskatchewan right now? Or what if we could up booster uptake for the bivalent boosters by 50% over what we observe now. What would the consequence be? That's what we're often interested in probing for, for many models. But I said often, it's not all. Some are more projection focused. You know, they're trying to forecast what's coming in the current situation. But a lot of deal with counterfactual. And it's just, it's important that they detect causality, that they detect how one thing impacts another causally, how it affects another, so we can ask these what-if questions. To not only detect what is the case now, but what could be. And often, that's why people use models, so they could say, what if we did this, what if we did that? Whether it's a big company, like Shell in the 1970s, that, that did incredibly well in the context of the oil crisis of the 70s because they had system simulation. In fact, it was system dynamic simulation to ask various scenarios, how would we handle that? And they were ready when the crisis came for how to react. They had thought it through. If this were to happen, how should we position ourselves? Or whether it's public health agencies or whether it's Canada's government for planning pensions they all use simulation models to ask these questions about how could we, how can we do better? Uh, how can we position ourselves more effectively? How can we lower our vulnerability to things in the external world that we don't control, like a downturn of the economy or change in oil prices or what have you? Um, so these models help us understand our vulnerability and understand where things are high leverage. I'll be with you just a sec, Ardalan. Um, ways that we might change things and improve ways different parties in different parts of the system might work together. Yes, Erdogan. Um, some, as you mentioned, sometimes they work very well, but sometimes there are some things that we don't know. But uh, for example, we say, okay, um, so for example, maybe the first thing to have and before COVID 19, yep. like, okay, the technology will involve this way. And That's right. like, and then something unexpected happened in the middle of Exactly. Like you mentioned in your lecture. Yep. But, you know, it affects everything in the model, like for example, the mm -hmm. complete model, a complete plan, complete changes. So right. when you design the model, how can you make it like so when you are when you are designing a program, you yeah. want to make it in a way that yeah. it is, uh, it, there is a bug, there is a problem yes. that we can it's flexible enough to be changed or in that's right. kind of shape in a way that you can uh, fix that's itself. Right. That's right. So in software engineering, we build our program so that um we, we have some we try to secure some sense often about where the risks are, where changes might occur, what might might evolve in terms of needs over time. And we'll build a program to give us that strategic flexibility to be changed in the ways that would let us respond to those changes. So maybe we know that you know this this program right now is being used by a group of only a hundred, but but there's discussions about rolling it out across Canada and maybe need about hundreds of thousands. We, need, we know we need to put an emphasis on scalability of this, that it has to be able to handle large numbers. And therefore we need an architecture and uh, certain, certain components of the infrastructure, maybe it's a big data database that will handle that scale. And we can do tests that would help us uh, ensure that we have high scalability of the system. So we do load-based testing and stress testing on it, et cetera. So, you know, models are similar in the sense that 
we have an inkling about where the needs might evolve and we build a model that will handle this diversity of needs. Okay. Um, so when we consciously build up a model, part that I'm always thinking about as a modeler, and I know Wade is extraordinary at this too, is, you know, how might the needs change over time? And we want a model that's positioned to respond quickly to the change. Look, in life, there's always going to be things that come out of left field, the curveball, the things you can't anticipate, the, the black swans that, that come in. And generally, we can't stop those things directly, yeah. right? But what we could do is make ourselves less vulnerable to them by being you know, judicious in our planning, consciously position ourselves to to give us that flexibility to respond to them, to give us that key ability to sort of uh, nimbly detect early when they're needed and rise to the challenge by the use of a model design that will let us translate into that. Uh, Wade's, Wade's COVID-19 model is a classic example of this, I gotta say. So, you know, within the first two months of the pandemic, he built a model whose basic architecture is still operating. And it's operating only in this province, but it's been used in Australia. It's been used uh, throughout uh, several of the territories here. Uh, it's it's really quite impressive. So we've had it used uh, by a number of partners and for different sort of levels of, of detail. So, uh, an adaptation in Alberta, Yukon Territory, uh, here for decision making in the province, still on an ongoing basis, Australia Capital Territory. Um, this is an example of a model that was designed with, with uh, just the right balance of, of detail, but ability to incorporate a bunch of other factors to handle you know, the latest Omicron subvariants which were not a thing at that time. They weren't specs in the cosmic eye, but savvy modelers know, you know, there's sets of things that can come down the road. Models evolve too. And you have to accept the fact that the models will evolve. Yeah. So uh, good points. And um, and we, and, and, and in general, it's a, it's a good lesson that, you know, um, we luck, favors the prepared. <laughs> um, uh, you can position yourself in life to be far less vulnerable and far better positioned to treat as an opportunity and not as a crisis, uh, sudden changes, okay? Um, so let's talk about the, the, the sort of structure of these models. So some models, this is something they have all in common. Models to detect, whether it's discrete event simulation, agent-based modeling, and system based or system dynamics modeling, they detect the behavior of a system over time. Um, they're dynamic models. Dynamic. Um, meaning if we're concerned with behavior over time. Now, the behavior of it cannot be spe pre-specified generally. We can't write down in so-called enclosed form, you know, what that behavior will be. We can't write down, for example, you know, that the model's output will be, you know, uh, e to the, you know, it'll be a sign of, sign of, uh, of, of the, uh, the, the time in years, uh, the, the value of years times two pi times, you know, e to the minus alpha times this B beta zero plus beta one times x one, blah, 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 t or something like that. We, we can't write down a form for what its behavior will be. The, this behavior is produced endogenously and in general for, for nonlinear models, there's actually like not, not a way to write it down actually you 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 cannot write down that formula out of these sort of nice functions so the state of, and, and the way in which this is produced over time is that we have the model at any one time 
whether it's discrete event, agent-based, or system dynamics, depicts a certain situation in the world, a current state of the situation, and it evolves in ways that depend on that situation. This is a very important point. Some people even use it to as kind of a definition of dynamical system. Um, but we're dealing here with systems whose what happens next depends on the current situation. Now that may sound right and, and sort of, well, what else would it depend on? But if you think about it, like if we have a system that just deterministically is growing at some fixed, fixed level. So, you know, over time, uh, it grows over, you know, every 10 time units, it grows by 30 units here or what have you. Like the growth of this doesn't depend on its current state. No, ma no matter where you are in this curve, it's gonna grow up by the same amount over the next 10 units, right? Doesn't matter if it's 10 units here, it's gonna grow by 30. It doesn't matter if it's 10 units here, it's gonna grow by the 30 after that. If it's 10 units here, it's gonna grow by 30. Doesn't matter, it doesn't depend on its state. This is not the type of situation where the change depends on the state of the system. And nor is this. This is just randomness over time drawn from a uniform distribution. Um, the, the value drawn at any one time is independent of all the others, independent of its history. It's just, its behavior over time doesn't depend on its state at all. Hmm? What's going on in the next little bit is completely independent of the past past situation of the current situation. Yes, Ardalan. Um, I have a question. So in the, every graph has a fluctuation, but they also some, they, even though they might not have similar patterns, similar shapes, yep. uh, um, but they can have patterns, right? They can have patterns. And I'm just saying that there are there are systems in the world. There are, there are processes that are dynamic processes, processes over time, whose evolution does not depend on their current situation. That's what I'm saying. And those are not really full-blown dynamical systems, and we wouldn't think about modeling them with one of these. We might think about modeling this statistically, and there might be statistical patterns here that are independent of any sort of state of the system and might have a lot of structure associated with it um, statistically. But it's not a system whose change over the next little bit is dependent on its current situation. And, you know, I could readily show you uh, in the process of, of creating these slides, I actually created a set of different distributions. And, you know, some of them have, what the hell? I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll go, um, you know, show you, okay, so how if we do this? I'll, I'll, I'll do something that's a, uh, that that is uh so this is a quite different set of patterns. This is like uh, uh a log normal distribution, log normally distributed. You know, most of that I used to down here, the occasional ones. This has a lot of statistical structure to it. There's definite patterns here, but they're not patterns of behavior over time where the behavior depends on its current situation. It's, and what we're dealing with in this class is those places where the evolution of the system is dependent on its current state, okay? And that's a broad class of systems, but it's not all systems. That's my point. You know, system simulation isn't for everything you want in the world. It's, it's, it's for a broad class of systems. There's most systems of certain sorts that the change depends on its current state and where the system, the behavior is emergent. Now, at a, at a practical level, when we specify these models, I'd say they're change. Given the current situation, the change over the next little bit depends on that current situation. The way in which we specify that in a model, regardless of whether it's system on MX, H base, or discrete event, is we specify how does the change over the next little bit vary based on the current situation? So do we specify an incremental change? 
Okay. And generally, we will see coming out of that, if you compound these small changes over time, we'll see this emergent behavior come out that we don't expect. So the picture here, ladies and gentlemen, conceptually, and, and different than a lot of traditional statistics, for example, is that you have a, a conception that you have data from the world that you observe. That data may have all sorts of patterns, but your focus here, your focus is how does that data reflect where you, your question you think about where does that data come from? What's the data generating process? Okay, what is this process that gives rise to this data? So there's this underlying system that you're thinking about. You're positing there's some underlying dynamical system, some system whose behavior is dependent on its current state that's evolving over time that gives rise to this behavior. Now we observe small bits of this system, bits here, bits there, bits there. That's what we observe. But we have to remember that this underlying system is evolving in a richer way than we typically directly observe. So for COVID-19, maybe we observe the cases, maybe we have counts of hospitalization, maybe we have information associated with, you know, the number that were, that, that passed away from COVID-19 in the past week. Maybe we have information that breaks it down by people in ICU versus those in the regular hospital, intensive care unit versus non-ICU wards. But that's just a piece of the system. There's a lot of the system we don't observe, right? There's people who may be infected out there, but don't realize it. There's people out there who may, may be spreading infection, but asymptomatically. There's people who are so recently infected, they're not yet contagious. There's people who have recovered and never were reported. So generally, this underlying system, like this one here, this lower level that gives rise to this, has a lot of pieces we don't directly observe. What we see is little bits, little bits, you know, from, from the observed data we have. And we, we seek to understand this much richer system that gives rise to it. And this system underlying here, per Ardalan's comments, that system down there will generally induce patterns up here that whisper of it, give us hints of it. And if you learn to listen carefully up here, there's things that will tell you about what's going on down here that will give you clues about what's coming up, what may be going forward. And by understanding this component, this underlying system, ladies and gentlemen, it can often give you insight as to how could things be different, be different if we were to intervene in this way or this way, if we were to impose broader mass measures or, or more uh, achieve greater levels of bivalent vaccine uptake, or if we could put in place, you know, mechanisms in, in elementary schools to, to reduce transmission, or if we could, for long-term care facilities, prevent different facilities from sharing staff to prevent the infection from jumping from one to the other, how would it affect things? It's by reasoning about this underlying system that we can change things for the better. We can bend that curve. And ladies and gentlemen, that is the enterprise of dynamic model. That is the enterprise of this. It's reasoning about this underlying system. This data is whispered to us of it. And the analogy here, I don't want to be unkind, but through too much of the past few centuries, um, people have sometimes lost track of the fact that the data we observe from the world is not the complete world itself. There's, it's, it's, a, it's a whisper of the world, it's a hint of the world, that it tells you something about the world, but there's a much richer underlying component. And uh, Plato, the ancient uh, Greek philosophy of Plato, has anyone heard of Plato here? 
Has anyone heard of Plato's cave? Does anyone, uh, can anyone on a venture, what was Plato's cave metaphor about here? Uh, yeah. Let me your name. Uh, Joel. Plato's cave was an idea that uh, the prisoners were in a cave and they never saw the ray of light. And they were told stories through shadow. And when they saw the light, they uh, they couldn't believe that it wasn't. Okay, good. So th there are these prisoners here, and there was their captors, the folks who captured them and, and kept them there, would would have a, a fire actually, and they 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 put up sort of things that would cast shadows, and these prisoners focused on these shadows. And they thought that was the world, that that was the extent of things, that this this was the true situation back there, these, these shadows. And they would reason about it and talk about the kind of the physics of the shadows, you know, what, what was going on in this world. But Plato's point is that, you know, there was a much richer world outside that these prisoners had glimpsed. And it was hard for them once they they went outside to fully appreciate, you know, the, the, the breadth of things in the world, to realize that these shadows were not, in fact, the world. They were merely a kind of uh, uh, epiphenomenal sort of um, uh, sort of artifice of, of what was created in the world. And the idea is that, that I'm trying to communicate here with this analogy is that a lot of the time in the world, when we see data, there's there's a risk, and I've seen this in my professional life from time to time, that people think that data is the reality. So they see uh, reports of cases, for example, of COVID-19, and they say, you know, that is the situation is there are these cases, and what more is there to talk about? There are these cases, and yesterday there were these cases, and tomorrow there, or and, you know, two days ago there were those cases. Um, uh, why why do you need modeling? We have the data. And you need modeling to ask, well, how can we do better? How can we reduce the number of cases? But you also need modeling to reason why are you seeing the cases? For example, you might be seeing those cases because, you know, there's maybe they're growing, right? One, one hopeful interpretation is they're growing because, sorry, one unfavorable interpretation is they're growing because of what? There's a, an outbreak, right? Um, maybe there's an outbreak in long-term care facilities, God forbid, and and a lot of people are getting sick and it's growing, you know, a um, hundred at the beginning of the week by 200 per day at the end of the week. That'd be horrible, right? That'd be, be terrible. On the other hand, one of the, another reason they could be growing is because you've set up a mass testing site, right? You've set up a drive-through testing site and you're doing better contact tracing. And so you're finding more people who are sick who otherwise would have gone unnoticed. And because they're found, you can encourage them to isolate or ask them to be sure to wear masks or otherwise protect them. You can get some of them to the hospital sooner if they need that level of treatment. So the point is that uh, well, it's easy to kind of plant the data and say that is the situation. Often, it is a whisper to us about a, a richer situation in the world that underlies it. And by reasoning about that richer situation, we can better interpret why we see the data, what's driving it, where it will go in the next little bit. And we can also ask what if questions. Okay? So, so just bear that in mind. Part of the philosophy of modeling, it's not that modeling is opposed to it. No, no, no. Modeling can help us make sense of it. It help us be more, more deeply, more savvily, more rigorously, more quickly understand the implications of data for what it's telling us about the world. And it takes us out of just thinking a situation where, you know, those shadows are the situation in the world to where they're just, you know, some glimpses of parts of the world and we're trying to make sense of what's giving rise to them and, and you know, why do we see them and under what conditions they will change. Now, often we, we, 
see nonlinearity here. We see a situation where there's a hole that's greater than the sum of the parts. Generally, with these systems, we struggle with. And indeed, the biggest challenges Canadian society and indeed global society face, you could enumerate you know, the top 20 challenges that your generation will be facing. The ones that my generation is struggling with, not so successfully, I might have. Um, those challenges are all characterized by being by, by nonlinearity, by a situation where we're dealing with a, a tangled set of factors that any one piece doesn't explain it. The whole is different than the sum of the parts. Not necessarily greater in the sense of better. It's, it's, it's often worse, but, but we need to understand the system as a gnarly, entangled, sort of uh, evolving um, vest, but, uh, whether it's issues of you know poverty and and and, and substance uh, substance use and and overdoses, or whether it's issues associated with uh, you know uh, the the plight of the homeless, whether it's issues associated with COVID nineteen spread or outbreaks of measles and pertussis and under-vaccinated communities, whether it's issues of climate change, uh, concerns involving ecological degradation, these are all systems issues. Some of them are wicked issues in the sense that they involve disagreements about values, moreover. But they're, they're all characterized by this whole difference from the sum of the parts. And certainly they, they also, by virtue of that, they lack this sort of closed form expression. Um, they have counterintuitive behavior. This is one of the biggest challenges. We we intervene, we think we're gonna do good, we have good hearts and they intervene, but if we're not judicious, if we're not skillful in our interventions, then we may make the situation worse. We may seek to help, but we end up engaging uh, and encountering what's called policy resistance, cases where the system blows back against us. It dilutes or it defeats, or it it basically stops any benefit from our from our intervention. Our line, yeah. Uh, can we kind of uh, reduce this kind of errors by um, having the ideas of different professionals from different areas looking at it? Because yeah. uh, our views are I don't know. At least my view is all. And sometimes I find myself is limited to what I'm seeing. And sometimes when you right. see it from other people's views, I mean, like. From other professional views. Like, That's right. We would get some data that we would think it's less, and we kind of find ourselves in a way that, well, we can actually move. I was wrong. Maybe this data is trying to tell something else other than it. So that, that that's true. So bringing together people from diverse perspectives who are very different perspectives, and I might add, different life experience, I mean, different backgrounds, different patterns in life. Very, very, very important. Not just a technocratic activity, it's, it's something more than that. Um, it's really important. But here's the thing when you bring them together, if you just put them in a room, besides power issues, you know, power differential issues that you know someone with a lived experience of homelessness is afraid to be you know talking with the minister of health or something like that, um, um, or with a a uh, uh, you know uh, constable in the room or something. Besides those uh, human theater issues, which are, are are things you have to deal with, what you get, you you risk getting without sadly uh, addressing it is uh, a tower of Babel because they speak different languages. They they're using different terms. So 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 I circulate like most of my meetings are are in a course of a day are very different things. And I deal with very different types of people. Sometimes I'm on the phone with the uh, you know chief uh chief uh, health officer for the, the health authority who are new to it. Sometimes I'm on the phone with with a fellow uh computer scientist doing machine learning. Sometimes I'm on the phone with a person who's a uh you know who has a clinical a clinical um uh, let's say a surgeon 
someone with a clinical background in medicine. Other times I'm on the phone with someone who's uh, from psychology background. And the terms they use are often different. And, and the risk is you put them in a room and they're speaking at cross purposes. So how do you have them talk in a common way? How do you have them have a common point of discussion they can point to and understand? You know what one of the best ways of doing this is? It's with a model. It's with a model, a dynamic model for dramatic effect. Put it up. It turns out models are really good for this because people can look at them and they can point at them and have some sense that they're communicating to the other person because they're pointing out a common thing. They're saying, you know, this stock of undiagnosed people or that that stage of the of the naturalist infection, whatever you call it. You can call it blatantly infected, or you could call it um, you know, uh not yet infectious, or you could call it um early stage infection. Uh, a rose by any other name is just as sweet, but they can all point at it and have some confidence they're communicating. They can look at the results and have some sense they're looking at kind of similar things. And this is one of the ways models are most useful to bring together people from very different backgrounds. Sometimes people have cross purposes with each other. You know, some of the early work went on with environmentalists and industrialists uh, running running factories, um, ranchers and farmers, you know, um, and urban city dwellers concerned about degradation of the environment. And you put them all in a room and, and actually have them talk about the use of the models and, and run what if scenarios with the models and talk about the results. It's surprisingly effective because they're talking about a common, what's called a boundary object. Okay. I have a so it doesn't yeah. make sense to me. So you are getting back to the same concept before. So you think that there will be people have different perspectives, and maybe we cannot understand everything that they say. And then they show them the model, they they will have some idea. But the way that they look at this different perspective, they might get a different message. For example, with let's say uh, oh, yeah. the person, the uh, currency of dollar is going down. A, a normal person might be saying that the currency is running down. A kind of the person who sells something might have a different. That's idea. right. So, so I mean, how can we gather in a way? I mean, how can we gather that idea, that message that the model is giving to them in a way that doesn't harm any of the situation? Well, I think what you want is people with different value systems and different backgrounds and different goals in that same room. Yeah. talking about the results and saying, look, the model needs to be expanded to include this as well. We need to have quality of life in there. Or we need to have, you know, uh, a representation of, um, you know, the the impact of poor quality water on, you know, I, I don't know, on um, on on birth, uh, birth defects or something. Or we need to have in there, you know, some representation of, you um, the anxiety costs associated with, uh, you know, uh, the, um, the the constant threat of of a um, you know of a wildfire or something like that. So you get people critiquing the model boundary and and saying it really needs to be expanded in this way, this way, and and that is something which which occurs. Uh, heard just the other other week, uh, actually, I think it was. Early this week, um, with respect to a model, you know, someone from community health and, and say, uh, community health uh, and epidemiology background spoke up and said, you know, you really need to to have this model also take to account, you know, issues involving um, uh, transient and ongoing homelessness because of this key link between what you're talking about here with substance use and, and that factor, and it made me think, oh. Yeah, you know, that's probably a a good technique, and and it wouldn't have been what I what I immediately thought of, but with their suggestion, we can start to be pushed in this direction. Okay, so so nonlinearity has a lot of consequences, and I would I would talk about these more, but I actually think we'd do well to to look at a model. So please bring up any logic, okay? And I'm going to load in. Some of the models. This will be real quick, like <laughs> off the off the website. Okay, off the 
the course site, the Canvas site. I put up there some example models. One of them is entitled Omicron SEIRS version eight. And just so you're aware, SEIRS refers to susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered, and then the fact that recovery can go back to susceptible. So SEIR, the S means like you can go back to S. Um, okay, so it should be up there on the course site, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so let's, well, we'll go up to the, the course course site and models discussed because, oh, it's version nine. Well, I'll load in version nine. I'm I'm sorry. I I was while you load that in, I'll load mine in. Okay. Uh there we go. And okay. Um so what sort of model is this? Can anyone say? If you look at that model, was it does anyone from that video think they might be able to recognize it's a system dynamics model? We see thought. Which represents the state of the system in, in different parts of the state of the system. State of the system. The current situation in this model at any one point is completely defined by the value here, 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 here. That's clicked on each of the boxes for those watching online. Okay. And uh, that completely defines the state of the system. You could run this model for a little bit. Stop it, copy down the values in each of these stocks, shut down your computer, go away, come back two months later, plug in those values and run it forward. And it'll be as if you just started, You it, it would be just like if you do it the first time, you had to stop it, okay? These states, the values in these states completely define the state of the system. The state of the system is specified by the values of these states. What are these things going between these kind of bad lines? There are flows, yeah. And they represent some, some movement over time of, in this case, people say, leaving the susceptible state and becoming exposed. No one's in the flow for some sustained time. No, no, no. It just represents people transitioning from here to here. And its value, if its value is say 10, it means 10 people per day. You could see it up here associated with the model. The model time unit is day. One means one day. Um, so if this had a value of 10, it would be 10 people per day. And this model has a depiction of people's natural history of infection going from susceptible, exposed to infection to recovered. Some of them become hospitalized. Some of those pass away. Others are are hospital uh, undergo discharge back to the community where they're recovered. And it's also totaling up the cumulative number of hospitalizations and the cumulative number of infections. And you'll notice the way that this totals it up. This takes this value and it puts it into the flow. There's just this one flow in there. This is the what of that. Does anyone who took 116, can anyone say this is the, begins with I, ends with L. There's a G in the middle and an R. Am I going to have to do a hangman? Um, <laughs> and, 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 and it starts with I N. Integral. This is the integral of that. This integrates this up. It's like it sums it up over time. Okay, um, the number of human hospitalizations, it sums up over time. If new hospitalizations is value of 10 per day, I'll be what 10 means. Um, in the first day, 10 people would come in. In the second day, 10 more people would come in. The third day, 10 more. The, the value of this stock would go from 0 to 10 after the first day, to then 20 after the second, to 30 after the third day, et cetera. So it, it integrates itself. These thoughts are accumulation. They are they're associated with these um, these sort of accumulations over time of the flows. And the stocks will go up if the inflow is greater than the outflow. It will go down if the outflow is greater than the out, uh, than the inflow. They could have many flows out and many flows in in general. 
But beyond that, there's feedbacks. So accumulations is one of the big concepts in system dynamics. Beyond that, there are feedbacks. Where is the feedback here? Where is the situation where the current, a little bit of change in the system will lead to a set of changes that will ripple around and maybe amplify that original change? There's a big change, there's a big situation for infectious disease models where a change will lead to a set of changes that will cascading set of changes sort of ripple through effects of changes that will amplify it. Can anyone say, is there a hand up? Yes, a name? <clears throat> yeah. Mortality. Okay, mortality will have a feedback associated with it. If someone dies, then there are fewer people to die in the future. So that's true. But there, that change in terms of the death will end up lowering deaths in the future. You know, if, you have, if there's a group of a thousand people and over the, the next 50 years, 500 of them die, there's only 500 remaining who can die. And, and so you'd expect over the next 50 years, fewer, fewer than 500, et cetera, to die. But there's another change with infectious disease models that's quite specific. All right, well, Sorry, terrible immunity. Okay, well, herd immunity is important, but it's it's not. Um, it, it's vaguely related to this, but I, I'm, I'm uh, but it's not what I'm looking for. Is anyone else? Yes, a, a name? Uh, ben. Ben. Infectious. Yeah. So if you have someone who gets infectious, it will lead to a set of changes. Say, people going through here to increase the number of infectious people that will increase the number of people around who are infectious who can then infect more people. So if one person becomes infected, they can go on to infect two people and then can infect four and eight and it multiplies and each new person infected can infect more people, okay? So there's a feedback there. We'll talk about this more when we get into system dynamics more seriously. But there's a what's called a positive feedback or a reinforcing feedback there. The more new infections there are, the more infectious people there are to perform new infections. So it 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 like builds on itself, right? It compounds. It's it's like a a a, a rolling ball of snow that gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, uh, so that's a system dynamics model. Now, in the interest of time, let's open up. Another model uh, from that same site. So that was system dynamics. So we've gotten that. Let's go look at agent-based modeling if we could. So let's go download a model. We saw that before. Let's go download this. Um, well, what the heck? Um, download uh, GIS and PA environment with scatter plots. Version seven. Okay. Okay. So so go get that one and load it into any logic. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna close up this one and I'm gonna load in that other one. Okay. Um and I'm gonna have to go get it on mine. Okay, here we go. And watch the time here. Okay. Um so I'm gonna to have to go real quick now. Hybrid models and then GIS and, and PA environment with scatter plots version seven. Okay. Here we go. So here we're going to have one or more populations occupied by individual agents. So in this model, we have uh, persons, we have supermarkets. We have homes, we have convenience stores, and we have parks. Those are all nominally agents, although really only some of them are more, more active agents. Um, let's go look at person. Person here is, is characterized by their evolution over time is characterized by a state chart uh, seen here to the right. And they have decision making about where they eat meals from a convenience store or a supermarket or their own larder. And 
as it turns out, they have some system dynamics that describes their weight evolution. But so this is really a hybrid model. Okay, but these people are placed into an environment in Maine, which is a geographic environment. And it turns out homes, each person also has, if we expand it here, a home. Were it only so in the world. Um, and each person also has things like a preference for convenience store meals. So the, to what degree do they really like those? I don't know, M&Ms or something? Um, in, in Australia, we like uh, Tim Tams and uh, floaties if you're in LA. And then they have an energy expenditure co coefficient. Um, Okay, uh, uh, which which has to do with um, uh, their their uh, how their energy depends uh, expenditure depends on their their weight, et cetera. Okay, um, so here we have a person with these characteristics. They're placed in this environment, and we have convenience stores and grocery stores, which will affect whether they shop for uh, at a supermarket or a convenience store, and. If we run this, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna run this baseline model here. We'll we'll see that these agents can be placed within a within an environment, a uh, geographic environment here. And oh no, I I zoomed out too much. I'm sorry, I accidentally zoomed out. I think. Um, so let me let me try that again. Okay. And uh, the agents are placed in this environment. You'll notice that many of them are at home now, but they're going shopping. They're going, they're going to grocery stores and they're going to convenience stores. This one's getting Tim Tams at that store. This other one is going to this, to this grocery store here. Okay. Um, and if you run as far enough, what you'll see is their weight evolution. The 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 evolution of their weight status will depend on their uh, predilection for shopping at a convenience store. This one, for example, is is you know um, is is a frequent visitor to this convenience store, partly because they like it, partly because it's located nearby. So their decision making is affected by this environment. Whether they go to a convenience store or grocery store, store depends on what's not nearby. And how much they go to a park depends on what's nearby. Now we could go click on this and place grocery stores around. And maybe we could tempt this individual here to go to, to grocery stores or other convenience stores by, by eliminating food deserts nearby them. And look, oh man, they've lost some weight. Um, now, if we scroll up here, we could see emergent patterns. Uh, for example, linking the fraction of meals in the convenience stores. Uh, versus their weight in kilograms or so relationships for people between the sort their distance to a grocery store or their weight um, or how close they are to a convenience store versus a grocery store on the one hand versus their weight this is an agent-based model we we have things at an individual level they're placed in environments they interact with the environment or with each other with other agents and uh, they evolve over time and we can total up outcomes uh, across the entire model. Okay, the final model I'll just refer you to, we don't have time to go into it. So that was agent-based modeling. The final model that I'll refer you to, we don't have time to, to go into it, um, is a model called trauma center. It's down here in the example model. Where did I go? I went to help. I went then to example models and help. And I scroll down on the right-hand side to find the trauma center. Uh, so help, example models, I scroll down to find it. And if you go simulate it, and people can start packing up now, because I know you got to get back to Thorvaldson for many of you or arts. What you're going to see now is a simulation environment. We have these for Saskatchewan hospitals, all six major hospitals in Saskatchewan. You see a waiting area, you see people coming in here, and uh, when coming in, they uh, engage in a set of processes which are governed by structured workflows. In particular, if you go to Maine here, and you were to scroll down, you'd find processes governing patient flow in this, in this environment. 
So people are walking in, they're handled with triage, they're sent to a waiting room, there's the registration process, et cetera. So this model has structured workflows, progress through which is dictated by the availability of resources. So for example, availability of a bed or a waiting room or someone to register them uh, or to help them undergo triage. So here we have structured workflows governed or the progress through this workflow of a given entity, in this case, not a person, is governed by availability of resources. And as a result, what you end up seeing is a an environment where you have different levels of utilization over time of rooms, of x-ray equipment or other diagnostic equipment of beds and of uh, physicians and so on. And you can look at statistics from these, you know, how often is the, are the, the um, nurses uh, in, in uh, busy or to what degree are the triage nurses uh, uh, constantly handling patients. How long do patients stay within the facility uh, in, in minutes for the emergency department or an urgent care area? Um, and how would this change if I increase the number of physicians, for example? This is a discrete event to me. It has to do with resources. Outcomes like throughput. How many can they treat per day? How long are people waiting? How long are the waiting lines? And you know how long are they in the entire process? How would we? How would it be affected if we had longer opening hours, for example, for the facility, so we could treat people through longer areas of the day, and understanding where the bottlenecks are in the system. This is discrete event simulation, and that's the third thing. Okay, that's all for today. Um, make sure you work on the take-home exercise. Thank you, everyone. Uh, there's a question.